All right, welcome. My name is Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the Department of Pediatrics, and as always, I'm delighted to welcome you to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Today is a very special session led by our chief resident on birth of the social mediatrician. So we'll hear more about that in a minute. Just want to make sure people know about two uh, special upcoming events. Every year, we normally conclude our Grand Round series with a staff and faculty awards day. So this year, we will do that, and I'll say more about that in a minute. But it won't be the conclusion of the year. Given all of the conversations and um, concerns just in the last few days about the mRNA vaccines and myocarditis, we really felt it was important, to, um, given our expertise here uh, in the department, to have a special session on that. So there'll be an extra grand round on Friday, July 2nd on COVID-19, mRNA vaccine, myocarditis in adolescents in young adults. And then we'll welcome you back after Labor Day. We'll kick off the year as we do every year with the Norman Kretschmer Memorial Lecture Series and a special debt of gratitude to Dr. Phil Sunshine, who every year brings us just exemplary inspirational speakers. And this year is no exception as Dr. Terry Inder is gonna be speaking to us about improving neurodevelopmental outcomes in the high-risk infant science and art. And then last, just please make a note, there's your text code for CME. It's uh, unique to each grand round and we'll put that in the chat for your convenience. Next slide. This is just again to highlight the, the depth and the breadth of awards that we'll be giving our faculty and our staff. We're so fortunate uh, to have two of our awards named after, one after Fernando Mendoza for his leadership around diversity and Laura Bacharach for her uh, leader as a mentor and our mentorship programs, but many other really uh, important noteworthy awards and opportunities to celebrate the incredible work our faculty and significant lots of awards for our staff, especially over the last year when people have been innovating and showing great spirit and collaboration. So a lovely event to look forward to. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Carrie Rasbach, who's our residency director, to introduce the chief residents and today's program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. It is my great pleasure today to introduce our incredible three chief residents as they present Grand Rounds. They are going to be presenting on what was their Scarly project this past year, which they have also presented at the APPD national meeting at PAS and at our Pediatric Research Day. And they are currently preparing a manuscript as well. I'd like to take a moment to highlight each one of them. And I'll start by Dr. Samantha Scanlon. She did her undergraduate at Harding University, her medical school at the University of Arkansas for medical science, and then came to us as a resident and was in the clinical research track here at Stanford, where she studied infectious pathogens in patients who had undergone CAR T cell therapy for cancer. She is a skilled clinician, teacher, leader, and scholar, and utilized all these skills in her role as chief resident. In addition, she is a talented athlete, having previously led our last Mathers Classic resident softball team against the faculty in 2019, and she has the organizational skills of Marie Kondo. Following chief year, she will be moving to Seattle, where she will be starting as a Peds Hemong Fellow at University of Washington. In addition, we have Bradford Wen, who did his undergraduate at Stanford, his medical school at the UC San Diego, and was in the medical education track here at Stanford, where he developed a curriculum to teach pediatric residents about the healthcare needs of transgender youth. Like Sam, he is a gifted leader, teacher, clinician, and scholar, and is masterful at leading change, both in building out social media and for other efforts. As an example, this year, he largely developed and led our transition to the X plus Y schedule within the residency. In addition to this, he builds teams through t-shirt making and group cooking projects. Following chief year, he will be moving to Houston where, where he will be starting a PHM fellowship at Baylor. Next, we have Julie Lee, who did her undergraduate at Stanford, her medical school at UC San Diego, and then joined us here at Stanford where she was in the STAT track um, looking at barriers to care for Latinx patients in the Stanford Pediatric Emergency Department. She is a gifted teacher, scholar, clinician, and leader. And what you may not know about her is that she grew up both in Mexico and the United States and is bilingual in Spanish and English. She is also a professional photographer and videographer and has skill and passion for creating images that inspire, unite, and delight. 
After she completes her chief year, she will be moving to Los Angeles, where she will be starting a Peds Emergency Medicine Fellowship at CHLA. These chiefs have been incredible leaders in our program. They have weathered a very difficult year and were exactly what our program needed during this time. A combination of humor, tech savviness, creativity, and determination, these chiefs have led the way to so many improvements in our program this year. I am delighted to invite them to present on just one of the many ways they have improved our program, which is focusing on birth of a social media trition, adopting Twitter, Instagram, and Slack for residents. Awesome. Well, thank you, Carrie, for that very kind introduction. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our grand round. We are so excited to be sharing with you today what the three of us have been up to this past year, apart from the obvious of just chiefing and running the residency program for a pandemic. And today we're going to be sharing with you about our chief project, um, which you have heard the title of, The Birth of a Social Media Trition, Adopting Twitter, Slack, and Instagram for our pediatric residents. And um, many of you don't know this, but this is actually a project that we envisioned prior to our chief year starting, and also prior to knowing that we would be in a full-on pandemic. But it was as though COVID knew where we had up our sleeves, and more than ever, our chief project was more than just a vision, um, but actually a necessity this past year. So we're just gonna get started. Thank you. We have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to disclose, including no ties to Slack, Twitter, or Instagram. A few objectives for our talk today. Uh, for one, we're going to describe the role of social media in medical education. We're going to discuss the implementation of social media in the pediatric residency program. And then um, lastly, we're going to evaluate the impact on resident communication, education, and connectedness. So a little bit of background, um, as I've mentioned, prior to the pandemic, um, one of the reasons why we wanted to have social media as our chief project was because we realized we were actually very far behind. Um, in the last few years, physicians have increasingly started to use social media to share research, education, networking, and for disseminating information. And you can see through some of our Twitter posts that we posted on the right side of our slide, which includes some of our very own Stanford faculty, um, and also increasingly journals and conferences are asking authors and attendees to provide their Twitter handles. And during the pandemic, we essentially saw virtually all training programs rapidly shift to virtual formats for education, community, and recruitment, which made social media such an essential tool this year. And we foresee that it's going to remain so essential for many, many years to come. And what we know is that little is known about social media use in the pediatric residency programs and how it might impact the sense of connectedness, education, and recruitment. When we were uh, talking about our project last night, one of the things that we had discussed uh, in terms of some background is like sort of how did we get to this project? Um, and I think there's a, a story from last year's residency council back in December when uh, a lot of our residents were actually talking about how we can sort of uh, come together as a program and different classes come together. And someone brought up the fact that, um, so at this time, every class had their own WhatsApp group. Uh, and so that's like 30 people on essentially one text thread. Um, and someone had proposed the idea of starting a, um, a resident wide WhatsApp, which should be essentially a hundred plus people on one text group, which as you can imagine would be sort of crazy. So um, uh, as we talked about what we wanted to do for our chief scholarly concentration project, I think the three of us came together and um, felt that, you know, we all had sort of different interests and skills and, and Sam's uh, amazing organization as uh, Carrie had mentioned and Julie and her ability and her keen eye to sort of elevate and promote things uh, and her photography skills. Um, for me, just my obsession with Twitter and um, how I liked to utilize it. So we came up with uh, an idea to sort of combine those things and um, sort of change how we communicate in our program and in medicine. So having said that, um, the three social media platforms that we adopted for our residents were Slack, um, Twitter, and Instagram. Slack was primarily used for communication, announcements, and it served as an educational repository of resources. And in just a little bit, we'll be explaining what this platform is all about for those who are unfamiliar with Slack. Um, Twitter, Twitter functioned as our source of education where we posted morning reports, we used it for advocacy, we used it for recognition of others, 
Um, and then lastly, Instagram was largely used for community building, also for advocacy efforts, hugely for recruitment, and also for recognizing um, others in our posts. So now that we've had a year with these three social media platforms under our belt, we are going to be sharing how we utilize social media this past year, and then also sharing some lessons we've learned along the way. Great. Thank you guys for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to start us off with our first lesson. Um, as Julie mentioned, we've sort of uh, formulated this talk in a variety of lessons that we've learned along the year. And we'll hopefully be able to show you some of the tools that we've implemented and how they've been received by our residents and uh, applicants. Um, so the first lesson, lesson that we took away from this project was how social media can be used as a tool for education. And this is something that's long been known in the world of med Twitter, but was little known to us, um, besides Bradford, who had mentioned uh, his prior interest in this project. Um, so there's an entire world, for those of you who aren't familiar, called med Twitter, which you can go down a ton of rabbit holes and learn a lot of different things. But there's a community on Twitter um, where people will share different resources or promote their papers or share research. And it's really interesting way um, to digest information in really short bits. Um, and so part of our project was really trying to tackle the idea of medical education and how social media can play into that. Um, and so as a part of that, Twitter became our sort of primary intention behind the educational component of this project, um, where we set out to catalog each of our morning reports with a variety of tweetorials, which I'll explain in just a moment, uh, to be able to share uh, with our residents as well as those outside of our institution, the teaching uh, that we have here at Stanford. Um, and so what you can see here is an example of a tutorial from one of our rising chiefs, Caitlin Billingham, who gave a morning report presentation on botulism. Um, and after the presentation, um, we were able to sort of create, uh, you know, an eight to 10 um, Twitter thread to be able to sort of show the different types of information that can be presented in this format. So um, what we learned throughout the year is there's a lot of different ways to make tutorials and some of the things that we found most engaging, both to our residents and people outside of our residency program, were when we had interactive components, as you can imagine. Um, our attention spans are pretty short, especially in this virtual world, so it's really fun to have interactive polls um, that are sort of spread throughout the, the thread to be able to keep people engaged and follow all the way through to the end. Um, and then we also were able to incorporate pictures and, and other didactics in these uh, tutorials as well. And then one of the really nice things that we were able to do with this medium is catalog the tweets for future reference. And so you can see down here at the bottom right, an example of a variety of hashtags that we use to catalog this specific tweet. Um, and we sort of kept this theme going throughout the year so that if you wanted to go back and reference a specific topic that you maybe you heard a presentation on, or maybe that you missed that presentation because you were at offsite, um, this way you could go back and um, find that information or, you know, if you remember hearing something about botulism and then it comes up as a differential when you're on the wards, you can easily search it. Um, so one of the nice features of Twitter is that um, it's really easy to find things if they are well cataloged. And so if, for example, you wanted to find this tutorial or a variety of other ones that we have, you would just go onto Twitter and search up LCCHP's chief and then hashtag whatever the topic is. So in this case, hashtag botulism and you'd be able to easily find this or you can search hashtag morning report and be able to find all of the ones that we've cataloged throughout the year. Something else you're able to do with Twitter is actually gather some more quantitative type information related to how many people see these um, tweets. Um, and so this is something we wanted to really look at to, to sort of assess the impact of our, of our intervention and also see what type of reach we're able to get with this particular handle. So, um, this is an example of impressions and engagement data from this, the tutorial that we just showed you from Caitlin. Um, and so what you can see here is that it gives us information around impressions and engagement. Impressions means the number of times people saw this particular tweet on Twitter. And so that can mean something as simple as it's showing up on your thread and you scrolling past it, or are you actually interacting with the tweet. And total engagement actually reflects people who have interacted with the tweet, who have opened it and expanded it and participated in it. Um, so you can see here that over 8,000 people saw this particular tweet thread and almost 500 people actually engaged in it. And you can imagine we don't have 500 residents and we certainly don't have that many morning reports. So this is really nice because we're able to reach so many more people and share this great information that um, our residents have put together. We also gathered similar data that you saw on the previous slide for all of the tweets that we have on our Twitter account between June 2020 and March 2021, which is the study period 
um, that we were looking at. And we sort of categorized them based on the type of tweet and, and what they were focused on, whether it was advocacy, didactic summaries, which is sort of our tutorials, um, whether we were recognizing colleagues, using it for recruitment, and then a variety of other things that could be a component of those tweets, like if it had a poll in it or if it had a video in it. Um, and while, as I mentioned, our initial goal for Twitter was primary edu ed primarily educational, something that was really exciting to see was actually the advocacy and social aspects of Twitter, which of course there already existed, but wasn't sort of what we intended for this. But we were able to really see the wide reach that um, a public facing platform like Twitter can have um, based on the number of impressions that we had on those particular tweets. Um, and then as a part of our study, we did a pre and post survey, which will show some of the data throughout this presentation. But as a part of that, we did collect some qualitative data um, regarding sort of impression of residents on what these interventions have meant for them in the course of the year. Um, and one of our uh, PGY2 residents mentioned that Twitter has been a great reference for them for morning reports. And it's especially helpful for people who aren't able to log in remotely or, or on different rotations um, and had to miss morning report. And so they're not, they're not missing that information if they think it's gonna be useful for them. And then here's an example on the bottom left of some, someone outside of our institution interacting with us and sharing appreciation for the work that we've done this year and being able to, to use these for themselves as well. And then another platform that I wanna talk a little bit more about that is probably a little less familiar to many of you is Slack. And we had previously introduced this, but it was a big component of how we communicate with our residents this year. Um, so Slack is a communication platform that um, contains a variety of different types of media, as well as um, a way to integrate a variety of apps. And it's used as a communication platform for teams. Um, so it's commonly used in tech companies and things like that. Um, one of the really nice things about Slack is that you can create sort of this private workspace. So we have a specific pediatric resident workspace. And then underneath that, you can create a variety of channels that are both public and private for a variety of different purposes. And the idea behind uh, integrating Slack into our residency kind of goes back to what Bradford had mentioned of how do we communicate effectively and quickly with all of our residents um, and also provide them ways to talk with each other in a, in a simpler way. Oftentimes in the past, our residents would be sort of on separate um, class specific uh, WhatsApps that didn't communicate with each other. Um, this is something really nice because it spans residency wide. Um, when we set up the Slack, it sort of morphed over the course of the year, but we set it up with specific channels that would be able to um, incorporate specific classes as well as all of our residents. And then also some fun channels as well that I'll show you here in just a moment. So how did we use Slack over the course of this year? As I mentioned, um, we have a lot of different channels. You can see example of some of the channels that we have here on the right-hand side. Um, so we had some that were used for announcements. So we asked that these channels remain unmuted so people could hear if there's something like a last minute change in the location of morning report or there's a different Zoom link because the last one's not working. This was, uh, enabled us to be able to communicate quickly with our residents in a way other than email. We know that email fatigue is significant and real. And we also know it's not an immediate form of communication. So this is nice because it integrates well on mobile phones as well as on desktop computers. We also have uh, some examples here of some posts that we would have in these channels. Um, all the way to the left, you can see on the P's Epic Tips channel, this was actually created by one of our residents and has been highly utilized to share Epic Tips and EMR tips that have um, come up throughout the year. You can see down um, sort of at the bottom, um, there is a, something that says view thread and it has replies. And so one of the nice features of Slack is that you can actually reply underneath the thread and not notify everybody in the group, but maybe ask a question regarding that particular post. We also have fun things like when we restock the snacks in the lounge for our residents, we share that. And then we have announcement channels like making sure people have a Zoom for a particular meeting. So some of the lessons that we learned from Slack, as I mentioned, our initial goal for this um, platform was primarily communication-based, but it actually ended up being really important for education as well. Um, so one of the channels that ended up forming through the course of the year was a PEDS clinical resources channel. Um, and this is where we essentially used it as a repository to store information from conferences, to be able to share PowerPoints, to share pathways from the hospital, et cetera. So our residents could reference that in real time, but also at later, later points in the year. We also were able to integrate Twitter onto our Slack. So there's actually a specific Twitter Slack channel um, for residents who didn't want to create their own Twitter handle and didn't want to follow along on another platform, but we're still able to find the information we had and be able to interact in that way. 
Um, and here we have an example from a, a resident who really noted the, the idea of institutional memory, which has been really useful for even us when we're in urgent care or on the wards and want to reference something that we know we heard about. So here we have a little bit of um, quantitative data from uh, usage of Twitter and Slack, especially in the context of education. So the bar graph on the left really just represents self-reported um, pre and post usage uh, of both Twitter and Slack. And you can see that more people use it at the end of the year as opposed to the beginning of the year. I do wanna note that Instagram was instituted a little bit later in the year. And so it wasn't included on the initial survey. So we don't have any pre and post data on that one. Um, and then the, the chart on the right here, you can see essentially frequency of Slack and Twitter usage, um, pre and post intervention in the context of learning specifically. And you can see that people felt like they were using it more often at the end of the year as well. All right, oh, this is my favorite slide. Um, so this is a little bit about what we learned about social media in relation to advocacy. Um, and you'll notice that some of those videos playing in the background are um, from some of our residents and residents across the GME programs um, who had organized a protest. And what, uh, what we saw with social media was how easily it was utilized for advocacy. And now our pediatrics program has a really, really awesome group, uh, the Stanford Pediatric Advocacy Council, um, who uh, even before this year has always been very, very strong, very, very um, uh, forward thinking and all of the things that they do. Um, and towards the end of our third year, even before we started Chief here, there were um, a, a variety of different things that they were doing, uh, both in the world and on social media to advocate for different causes. And um, I did want to take a moment to, to highlight how um, we as chiefs have seen social media sort of unroll. Um, so as many of you know, um, uh, back in December, we had some issues with our vaccine rollout. Um, and now this conversation isn't about the vaccine rollout, but more how social media played a role during this, uh, this ordeal. And um, Slack, uh, in turn, allowed for more rapid communication and greater transparency. Um, and as our hospital was uh, dealing with issues regarding an inequitable vaccine rollout due to an algorithm issue, um, uh, we had this instance of a resident who messaged us through one of our uh, residency council channels, letting us know that um, lots of people were talking about the issue and wanted to bring it to our attention and quote unquote told us all the group chats are popping at the moment, meaning lots of people were talking on their own WhatsApps or Slack or whatever means of communication they were. And they, they brought it to our attention and we rapidly were able to respond saying, you know, we were informed of the issue at 7.15. We've been on a meeting since eight um, and we will have a response by tonight. And uh, meanwhile, while they were having all of their conversations, we were also having our own conversations with um, leadership uh, across GME and our own chief residency council. Um, and through the night, uh, the GME council was working together and collaborating on Zoom and on our own WhatsApp group and through email and on Google Docs to um, uh, write an open letter that we were la later able to send to our residents and hospital leadership um, by midnight that night. Um, and, you know, one of the things uh, that we learned was, well, first off, we, we do get lots of feedback and, and with instant messaging, it makes it a lot easier to give feedback. And we always encourage our residents to give feedback uh, when possible. Um, and in this instance, they, they did feel supported uh, and this was feedback that we appreciated. Um, I think uh, residents really quickly took to social media during this, uh, this uh, these events and um, they wanted to facilitate discussion and enact change. We stood beside them. Uh, we publicly and unabashedly posted statements in defense of our residents advocating for change. And what we learned was that our residents value transparency and in particular, they valued fast transparency. So we were really quickly able to message with all of them. And even in the days uh, following, there were frequent messages to us asking like what progress we were being made. And so we could keep everyone up to date um, through uh, Twitter, through Slack, through Instagram, where we made uh, several posts. Um, and then residents themselves were, were posting lots of things and um, many, many things came out of uh, uh, this, 
event last December and January. Um, and some of them, many of them were positive things. Several residents, me included, uh, received an outpouring of support from our colleagues across the country, um, whether that be our uh, former co-medical students at other programs, uh, many who are remarking that resident unrest at Stanford was making um, their programs sort of look at their own um, vaccine algorithms and rollout processes um, to prevent a similar situation from happening um, there. Um, and then so what also, uh, in addition to that, um, you know, a community was formed uh, out of this. The Chief Residency Council had their own WhatsApp um, and then alongside that, there was a 220 plus strong GME house staff WhatsApp that um, sprung up during that. And for any residents who are on this call that are part of that group, remember the hundreds of notifications that we were getting uh, in December and January from everyone who wanted to contribute and had an opinion or were posting different uh, news articles to, to quickly um, discuss what was going on with everyone in GME. Now, you're probably asking, well, Chiefs, you're talking about WhatsApp, but your project was on Slack. So one of the really cool things um, to note is that Slack does offer some different capabilities that WhatsApp does not offer. It's a sort of a closed system that people can pop on and off um, of different groups or channels uh, and allows for customizable communities. Uh, and then threading the messages allows for clear messages. So it prevents people from being completely inundated with messages and being lost in it and organizes it in a different way um, that makes communication a little bit more efficient. Um, and so from that standpoint, uh, one of our most recent GME council meetings, we were actually talking about, you know, the WhatsApp was really great in January and it sort of died down, likely related to um, uh, a lot of the messages that were going on sort of making us inundated. And so we've actually had a conversation about transitioning that over to Slack and getting all of GME house staff onto Slack. And so uh, some of you may have received an email already about enrolling into Slack, uh, the Slack GME wide house staff group. So this is uh, certainly something that's, that's spreading. And even last night, uh, one of my colleagues who's a rising neuro uh, chief resident um, texted me um, saying they saw our announcement about Grand Rounds today and was actually wondering if they could um, touch base with us and ask about, um, ask about uh, integrate, the potential for integrating Slack into their own program. So it's certainly something that people have seen useful and um, has uh, potential for uh, other areas of the hospital as well. And now going back to our conversation about advocacy, you know, a lot of residents have been um, taking to social media to promote different causes. And um, I know all of you remember back when we were posting our, uh, our selfies from our vaccinations to uh, encourage other people to get the, their vaccines as well. Um, and then our community rotation um, has even encouraged uh, our residents to partake in advocacy on social media as well. And um, that video on the right that you see was some of our interns promoting mask wearing very early on in the pandemic. Uh, uh, very, very early in the year, this was June of last year, um, our advocacy group also um, uh, organized a rally, the White Coats for Black Lives rally, and social media was certainly um, a portion of that rally getting people together. It was crazy how fast um, sort of the message about this rally spread, um, and we uh, wanted to support our uh, Peace Advocacy Council posted um, some announcements uh, alongside them and really found that in the end, uh, our advocacy posts um, garnered a, far more attention than um, a lot of our even more educational posts. Um, and then there were a variety of causes throughout the year um, that our residents were partaking in, um, in trying to promote things on social media and in the pivotal election of last year. A lot of them were um, getting out there and trying to uh, rally the vote. And so now we transition to our next lesson, which we um, use our social media for a lot this year, which is for recruitment. Uh, we've learned that social media is a very important tool for recruitment this past year, and it's going to remain so. Um, we've seen that applicants and heard that applicants visit and learn about residency programs through program social media accounts, particularly in light of virtual recruitment where they were not able to come in person um, to visit these programs. And they also engage with programs um, and their residents in the form of private messages, comments, and likes on posts, uh, which was in the case of our program. 
And as far as we know, recruitment will remain essentially virtual again this upcoming year. And so will also be extremely important for us to keep up with uh, social media in regards to recruitment, not just for our residency programs, but also for uh, fellowship programs at WISE. And so one of the biggest uses of our Instagram account was to showcase our program and our fantastic residents and faculty. And so we uh, will be talking a little bit about all these different things that we did with our Instagram, but we did the behind the mask series, which I will show you all in a little bit. We used it to also showcase rotations. We did resident shout outs and faculty shout outs. Uh, we shared a lot of videos throughout the year. We also used our uh, social media platforms to do announcements and then also to um, promote advocacy. And so here um, are some examples of videos um, that our very own residents um, did on their own initiative. Um, and something that our applicants have shared over and over again, how much they appreciated seeing these videos. And so on our left is a video um, of our LPCH dance tour, which was you know, organized and initiated by two of our amazing residents. Um, in the center and on the right side are also some of our residents um, sharing videos of themselves and the day in the life of, here you fill in the blank of an intern, or a day in the PICU. Um, and that really gave our applicants a, a preview of what it would be like to work um, as a resident here. As I've mentioned before, we use Instagram to do a lot of events and announcements. On our videos on my right side and left side are different um, events that we promoted throughout the year. The right side was um, Resident Appreciation Week and just giving them uh, highlights as to what's gonna be a, they, they can expect that day. And then to our left was a walk down memory lane for the costume contest, which we still successfully had this year despite the pandemic. And then in the center are just pictures and announcements of different events that happened throughout the year. So on the top, uh, we had we essentially um, had a weekly tennis session with our residents throughout the summer and fall. Um, and then on the bottom, we announced our amazing fellowship matches as well as our residency wide uh, debate um, and other events that I'm not showing here, but you can definitely see in our Instagram page. So uh, something that has been so well received and continues to be very well received and people ask more of is um, what we call the Behind the Mask series. Um, this is a series of stories that are submitted by our residents um, and faculty where they can just share about really anything about themselves. Uh, we offer them some prompts that they can consider to get their creative juices flowing. But really at the end of the day, they can write about whatever they want about themselves. Um, and they don't even have to write anything about our program. Um, and then we submit it um, on their behalf to our, to our Instagram page so that others, including our very own faculty and residents, get to know um, each other. As you guys have um, can tell, this past year has been difficult in terms of meeting new people. We're always behind a mask, but there always is a person and more to that person behind the mask. And so that's how we decided to name it um, this, Behind the Mask series. And so we welcome any um, faculty within our pediatrics program, as well as our residents who continue to submit these stories because over and over again, we even hear from our applicants or even our incoming interns how much they really appreciate learning about our residents and faculty through these series. And shout out to all of our residents and faculty who have participated and any residents on the call, if you are interested in being featured next, feel free to reach out. Something else that we've also done um, to showcase our program, our rotation and team features, where they um, get to learn about our amazing teams and top rank subspecialties within our program. So here you'll see the red team and the green team um, being featured in a photo, then the Gartner acute care team and the yellow team, not only featuring our residents, but also our fellows and our um, attendings and then the blue team and the silver team as well. And there are many more other teams that I didn't get to showcase here, but are definitely on our Instagram page. Wasn't there a time where one of the color teams tricked the other teams to to wear their color too? There was. It's not in this photo, but I believe one of either the red team or the green team tricked the other team to wear their colors. So at the end of the day, it was a team photo of all the same color. So something that I also would love to highlight is this Instagram live series, which I really want to shout out and highlight our residents because this was done in their own, on their own initiative. Um, and we love our residents so much for it. Um, so it was their idea to bring what is called an Instagram live, which is a feature on our Instagram, 
where they essentially go live on the camera. Um, and also applicants are told, you know, at 5 p.m. tomorrow, we're going to go live. Come join us for a Q&A session. We know this virtual recruitment season is tough, but we really want to be there for you and answer all your questions. And so this was organized by our residents. Um, and they just asked us, could you help us moderate? Or just like, can you use your account? And like, Hansian, of course, will be there to support you. And so they did um, three series. One was a Stanford Peace Combined Program Q&A. Uh, moderated um, by our uh, by our residents. Then the second uh, one of the other ones was a Q&A with a piece categorical. And then the last one, a diversity inclusion and advocacy at Stanford Peace. And again, I want to highlight that all of this was not even influenced by us, the chiefs, it was all resident led. I would really highlight the power of including your community in your social media efforts. And I also want to highlight a video that they made on their own um, to also showcase our program. <sighs> It's the people. The best part of our residency program. It's the people. The people. It's definitely the people. How can I put it into words? The best way to describe it is this. My co-residents pour their hearts and souls into advocacy. They show up to support me. To support me in things like karaoke. To support me on all the days that I need it the most. To support me when I stood in front of 800 colleagues and told my story at a rally for racial justice. To support us. When the night shift gets tough. They push me to be the best version of myself every day. And then um, when we asked our current incoming intern class um, if they ever visited our Instagram page this past recruitment season, um, a whopping 81% of them um, said that they did visit our Instagram page during recruitment season and actually found it very helpful. And so shout out to our incoming intern class who are now with us at the LPCA sort of campus, um, and we are so excited to be welcoming you to our Stanford family. All right, so moving on to our next lesson, uh, another big thing that we wanted to tackle this year was this idea around connectedness. Um, this was even something that we were concerned about even before COVID, and of course, was made even worse during the pandemic. Um, being in a pretty large program and having various clinical sites and variety of tracks, um, we wanted to be able to figure out a way to connect our classes uh, to each other and make them feel a more part of our family. Um, and so we were hoping to tackle that a little bit more with our social media project. Um, so here you can see some uh, representative quotes as well as some data from our pre and post survey um, in the area of connectedness based on resident perception after our intervention. So I'll first draw your attention to the table on the right here. Um, this shows the effect of our social media interve intervention on the perception of connectedness to and within a variety of groups. Um, and of course, this year was compounded by COVID, so it's a little bit hard to interpret some of the data. We know that it was hard to feel connected to anyone this year, but something that I want to bring out here is that um, at the end of the year, um, we saw that there was an increased perception of connectedness between residency classes, meaning between the interns and juniors and juniors and seniors. Um, which has always been something that we've wanted to work on. So we're grateful that that's something that definitely changed over the course of this year. And then um, you can also see a, a few representative quotes from our qualitative survey um, in regards to especially Slack and Instagram in the area of connectedness. Those were the two that ended up touching on that piece a little bit more often. Um, so the first quote here up on the top left, um, one of our residents said that they felt like Slack allowed them to communicate between classes more and kept them up to date on events and notifications in the residency program. They also felt that Slack was effective for communication and organization. And then um, they also had kind of this general sentiment of having greater connectivity to the program through Slack. Um, in terms of Instagram, um, a number of our residents um, have commented on this, but a couple of quotes that we've shared here is that um, one resident felt that Instagram definitely made them feel more connected in the program, and especially during a time when they weren't able to physically gather. Um, and then another resident just again sort of reiterating this Instagram creating the sense of belonging and connection to the program. Um, here we have a few examples of our own residents and their own social media. Um, oftentimes, um, our residents will make posts or stories, especially on their Instagram, and tag us to share it more broadly. Um, and a lot of these are shout outs to, to their friends that um, they enjoy working with or events that are happening in and outside of the hospital. So here you see an example of some cookie decorating with our social committee. Um, after match day, our new child neuro interns FaceTime each other um, and getting to meet one another. Um, two of our current interns, Braden and Christina, sort of sharing about their 
experience on uh, intern night float together. And then some of our residents during the holidays sharing and some of the, the holiday fun as well. Um, Slack became, uh, a, as I mentioned, a very big part of our communication mechanism. Um, and you can see here sort of a run chart of messages and files throughout the year. Of course, it varied from time to time, but um, we were able to collect some data saying that over 50,000 messages were sent over the course of the last um, 10 months or so um, across uh, all channels in our uh, pediatric residency platform. All right, that brings us to lesson number five. Um, and I think this is something many of us are and should be aware of. Social media is not perfect and has some of its own problems as well. Um, and it's something that we as pediatricians may even uh, talk with some of our patients, especially teenagers um, about. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to talk about is hashtag FOMO. Uh, and for those of you not in the know, uh, FOMO stands for fear of missing out. And that's uh, something that uh, we millennials use to talk about um, how we want to be at things and sometimes can't. Um, and so in our qualitative data, there were some notes uh, from some of our residents who had, uh, who, who uh, evoked a sense of FOMO uh, with a lot of the social media that we were posting. So in one instance, a PGY one said, I do feel like sometimes I'm missing out on things that are posted on social media, but aren't communicated through other platforms. Um, and that also goes to show that everyone has their different preferences for how they want to be notified by things, whether it's texting or emailing or through any of the number of social media platforms that we use. Um, and unfortunately, we can't do everything because we also want to uh, protect our residents. Uh, but that certainly is something that we need to be aware of and that um, uh, some people may not receive all of the messages that we send them. Um, and then one of the other things that we noted in our qualitative data is that some, uh, some individuals may feel that what's posted does not always align with uh, their perception of things. Um, and I think that is something that is fairly well known in social media and something that we need to uh, be aware and privy about, um, especially as our teenagers uh, that we take care of, they also have some sense of, uh, uh, of lack of identity or belonging in their communities as they uh, scroll through tons of photos um, of their peers that are always you know, showing these very manicured and happy posts. And we have to be aware of that and we have to mitigate that. Um, that's why I think this slide is actually very important um, in acknowledging that that's something that we need to be aware of and that people aren't alone in this. Um, and in this instance, uh, we had a PGY3 who mentioned that the only social media platform I somewhat followed was the Stanford Peds Instagram and the photos videos understandably tried to paint a very wonderful picture for applicants, which felt disconnected from the feelings of the actual residents. And while most of our qualitative uh, comments were positive, I think that the, the couple of you know, highlights with some of these comments are really important to take note of because there are unintended consequences with any intervention that you do and you have to be aware of those things. Um, but I think we learned a lot from that and I think that's important as well. And then um, the last thing that we wanted to talk about um, uh, in, in terms of uh, issues that we may have dealt with or need to be aware of are professionalism concerns. Um, I think that as we have a more public facing outlet, we have to be aware that, you know, patients can be viewing some of these public posts that we um, have and other people, while you may um, uh, not intend for the world to see, we have to know that a lot of these messages have a sense of permanence out in the world. Um, and so we have to be very careful and very respectful in the things that we post and then there's a risk of oversharing and we have to be very privy to make sure that we're protecting patient data. And very fortunately, um, you know, we haven't uh, had very much, uh, uh, very many issues with that sort of uh, side of things. But then there's also the opportunity and ability for people to post about their frustrated feelings about things and may post um, something that is not professional. Um, that's something that uh, we worry about and have seen in the past. Um, and so we need to be really um, um, aware that, you know, our voices are important and impactful and do have a sense of permanence and that other people may react to those things. Uh, but to end on a lighter note for this uh, lesson, I think that we have learned um, tons throughout this year and our residents do engage in social media um, education when they arrive here as interns. Um, and so I think it's important to continue to focus on some of those 
things as well as we move forward. So lesson six, um, we all know that social media seems daunting, particularly for those who are not very vested or experienced in social media. However, social media is actually simpler than it seems, especially when you share it with others and utilizes your resources well. As I've mentioned, um, involving others is really such an important part of our social media efforts, and we love our residents for it. Um, residents bring full creativity and talent um, that sometimes we sometimes have a block in our mind, but other people, when they are able to use social media, they are able to like unleash the potential in different ways. And so as um, we see in the first video, this is the video that was initiated and choreographed by our residents that had no influence by us. And they even incorporated our faculty um, and our nursing staff from the Gartner Clinic to get uh, this dance so that we can post it to our social media. And then another thing um, about social media is just consistency. Um, but consistency doesn't mean constant. And so we feel this daunting task to have to post something every day. But if you were to really scroll through our Twitter and our Instagram feeds, we post maybe one post every one to two weeks, sometimes a little bit more depending on how many events we have. Um, but what I want to highlight is that consistency is what I think is, has kept the momentum going. Because whereas maybe other programs have stopped posting to social media after their recruitment efforts, we have continued to consi consistently do so um, throughout the year. And then lastly, utilizing your resources. There are so many free resources in the World Wide Web that are at our disposal. It is just up to us to find it and to really use it um, to their fullest potential. And this is actually one of my favorite lessons and favorite slides to get to share with you all. Lesson seven is that lighthearted fun can also be really impactful. Um, of course, we set out um, with a scholarly project in mind and wanted to address big issues like education and communication and connectedness. Um, but as a part of that, it's also okay to have fun every once in a while. So um, you can see here it featured a TikTok that we made back on Halloween where we just ran around the hospital and performed magic. Um, and we're able to share this across multiple platforms, including um, TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and we're really able to reach a really wide audience with that. Um, and this tends to be actually the post that we hear the most about from people even to this day. Um, you can see some of our um, impressions data. Um, this is just from Twitter. Um, we reached almost 20,000 people um, with this post alone. Um, and then we also, of course, had some on our other platforms. So um, our jobs are hard. We work hard. It's okay to have fun with this every once in a while, too. And that will re-energize you to keep going. And just seeing this video, I just really wanted to quickly comment that. Uh, so Carrie Rosbach, our program director, uh, she has uh, been at our side through this last uh, year and her participating in this video uh, certainly is something we appreciated so much but we also want to just really quickly thank her for um, all of the things that she's done to support our random shenanigans including uh, doing this silly video with us oh my slide too all right uh, lesson number eight, uh, culture change can be slow but they will come around um, and uh, so I want to briefly touch on the fact that, um, you know, when we implemented this project uh, last year, um, there were some skeptics, some people who like groaned about like, oh, social media, more social media, um, and a lot of people who did not want to partake in it. And one of the things that we quickly saw was that um, it was uh, some of our more senior residents who were uh, a little bit more skeptical and a little bit more resistant from uh, partaking. Um, and we learned very quickly that our, some of our newer residents were more quickly to jump on the boat and start their own um, Twitter accounts, jump on the Slack and use it um, right off the bat, which was uh, something that we noticed um, in terms of like culture change. Um, it's much easier to uh, change uh, the culture for those who are just learning. They're much more malleable um, and it, it uh, does make us wonder in, in the future as this um, sort of goes on in, um, with more people who are more privy to the system and using Slack and Twitter and things like that, um, will there be more of an impact? Um, this is uh, one of the quotes that I heard at the end of my third year of residency in one of the workrooms from a now current PGY3 resident. Um, was that we're dinosaurs, the anti-vaxxers are rallying on Twitter and we're faxing medical records. Um, I think that um, uh, culture change and the things that we do in medicine are very, very 
slow to change, but we need to be aware that, you know, change can be good and we can always keep reevaluating uh, um, sort of those things that we implement to make it better because we always want to be improving in the field of medicine. And this picture is just a scavenger hunt that uh, some of our interns had slacked us a photo of with that creepy dinosaur on the third floor. Um, and then just to uh, give you an indicator of some culture change throughout the year, this is a run chart of weekly active members. So members who uh, posted or uh, read a message in the channel. And you can see that when we first implemented it back in uh, May, there was a slow um, sort of onboarding of all of our residents um, where we sort of reached a peak in June as a lot of people were trying things out. Um, and then throughout the year, you see people start to drop off, use it a little bit less and you have your peaks and valleys, but then, um, you know, there's a sort of renewed sense of, uh, uh, um, of involvement uh, this last May as our rising chiefs have started to include other people. Um, they've brought our residency coordinators um, onto the Slack channel and then have uh, now invited all of our incoming interns who are at orientation right now. And, um, make sure to say hi to them if you're around. Uh, but they are also on our Slack channels as well um, and we're able to communicate with them there. In terms of future directions, there are a lot of things that we can continue to look at and do with social media. Um, and I think assessing long-term impacts, again, culture change is slow. I do wonder, you know, three years from now when you have uh, three intern classes who started off with Slack, what it'll look like, will it be different? Uh, will there be a different uh, renewed um, use of uh, the different channels that we have on there? Uh, we don't know. And then there are lots of new frontiers, as I mentioned, the Rising Chiefs added um, our program directors to the Slack group. Um, we can certainly, uh, what's not to say adding some of our program leadership or hospital leadership uh, into some of these spheres. Um, and then there are other social media platforms, things like TikTok or LinkedIn, um, and then Doximity, which is a social network for healthcare professionals as well. And then there's social media beyond the pandemic. We, you know, we did this intervention during the pandemic while people were socially isolated um, and practicing social distancing. Um, I am curious to, uh, we are curious to see what, uh, what else is there and what capabilities there are when people are, uh, you know, together and potentially could be interacting on social media in the same room uh, at conferences and things like that. And so that, with that, our future directions, um, uh, we are the outgoing chiefs. We've had a very exciting year behind us and uh, we're really excited to hand off to the, to the future chiefs. Um, and uh, you can consider this uh, Grand Rounds presentation our social media handoff, where we hope you're able to continue some of the things that we uh, did this last year. And we want to encourage you to try some other platforms. And now TikTok is rapidly uh, growing in our pediatric population. So get on that as well. <laughs> All right, we are now at the, at the end of our Grand Rounds talk. If you haven't already, definitely do follow us on Twitter and Instagram so that you can continue to get to know our residents more and also see what's going on within the program um, in the year to come. And so if you peruse through our accounts, you may be surprised with a dance video, a song by our talented residents and stay up to date with residency announcements. Uh, but truly thank you all for supporting us in our journey this past year through your comments and your encouragement as we're walking down the hall and by um, engaging with us on our social media platform. Thank you, Chiefs. We've got a bunch more questions, both in the Q&A and uh, some that have come through the chat. So I'm going to ask you a, a bunch of questions if you could um, answer as um, concisely as you can so we can get through them. And I know some people will have to sign off, but we'll, we'll try and get through a few more of these questions. Um, one question is, how do you decide uh, whether to use email or Slack for particular communications? And when is email better? When is Slack better? That's a great so, question and one that we ask all, ourselves all the time. Um, I think when we, when we have something that we really want to make sure that no one is missed and it's important, um, and it's not something that's happening five minutes from now, that's something that would go out in an email. Um, it's not uncommon for us to sort of double post. Um, so we'll send something in an email and also send it out on our announce page um, so that people can see it immediately. Um, but if it's something that we just are trying to share quickly um, or it's something that a little bit more fun, um, we'll send it through Slack. 
Um, and then if it's something like a poll that we want to just get sort of like a snap poll, that's something, of course, that could be done through Slack. Yeah, one of the funny things is that, that, that I think about when people ask me that is um, our intern year, the chiefs actually used paging a lot to notify us of things. And so a lot of us would get that 8 a.m. page saying like, come to morning report. And so residents today don't know the pain of waking up post-call to a, hey, come to 8 a.m. morning report page. Um, so we definitely are try trying to be very judicious about when, we, when and how we message things. Great. There were a couple of questions about compliance and sort of privacy issues. Who owns the data? How can things be deleted if there's a regret about what was posted? Um, and also who oversees the social media to make sure that it's done in a professional way? I think there are, there are multiple parts of that. And I think so there's the more private and personal um, individuals who make posts, in which case, you know, they are uh, functioning adults. They are the ones who are operating their own uh, personal accounts and we're not moderating their speech. Um, we still do social media training for all of our residents before they get here. Um, and so there are certain things that they need to be aware of and not post about um, and have the balance of both respect and responsibility in our positions as publicly facing people, uh, much in the same way that if you were to speak in the town square publicly, you are held liable for the things that you say. Um, for our own accounts, you know, we, uh, we do want to function in a professional manner and we sort of uh, moderate our own posts. They're not necessarily being filtered through any other um, higher means, um, but it does allow us the freedom to uh, post what we see fit. And one of the things that we do note is that, um, you know, they are the views of us three and not necessarily of the institution. Um, and I think that's something that people need to be aware of. Um, but there are certain liabilities. In terms of who um, hosts the, the content on the servers or who owns it, um, I think from the social media parts of like Twitter and Instagram, there are, um, you know, live, uh, there are uh, essentially online contracts that we've all signed that, that um, portray social media uh, in, in such a way that that is still in the realm of Twitter and Instagram. But for Slack, um, it's actually through an enterprise license through the university. Um, and so these are on um, uh, uh, Stanford University controlled uh, um, servers and much in the same way that, you know, our Microsoft license uh, holds email. I'm not privy to all of the, the details of it, but we essentially treat uh, Slack like it is our email and that, you know, we should still be uh, messaging each other with, you know, respect. Um, and I think that's an important responsibility that we all hold individually. Thank you, Bradford. And I'll, I'll just add, when we had the Behind the Mask series, I know you had uh, residents film videos and create posts and then save it, and then you guys reviewed it and, and posted it. So there was a- That's uh, correct, yeah. So any, uh, those three videos that you saw of a day in the life of, um, we've had residents record it with their phones, but then we had them send it to us for us to review to make sure there were no HIPAA violations, and then we would upload them for them onto our account. So yes, they were reviewed um, by us prior to posting. Great, thank you. There was a question about whether you will be publishing your analytics and best practices from this work. That's the goal and that's what we're working on at this time. So stay tuned for more. Great, there was also a question about uh, what is posted on social media? This is by our new Dr. Abadia, who um, is asking about whether we should post both you know, the less positive parts of being a resident as well as the, the positive parts of being a resident. Um, and should we be transparent about what residency is like, how tough it is? Um, and should another aspect of the program uh, be that showing people are human and genuine? I think it's a great idea. And we would love Dr. Abadia to help <laughs> coordinate something like that. I'm sure that the rising chiefs would really like it. I think, I think it is important. We've, you know, we talked about the value of transparency and that's something that's come across loud and clear this year. Um, and we also don't want to just continue to perpetuate the myth that, you know, everything is fine and dandy when it's not always that way. 
Um, of course, there's something to be said of like, we're proud of our program and we love our residents and we want to portray that. But I think, you know, being realistic and being human is also um, something important and accessible. Great. There were a couple of questions about um, uh, the time it takes, both daily time for each of you on social media, and then also how much time are residents spending on social media each day or week? Yeah, so that varies per resident how much time they spend on their own volition on their uh, social media accounts. Um, but for us personally, um, there are three of us. And so there are, we only um, generally mostly post morning reports done by teaching seniors. And so we usually have two a week. And so if you divide the task between us, we, one of us is responsible for you usually a Twitter post a week. Um, and in, term, in terms of Instagram, that also like, as I've mentioned, we post maybe about every one to uh, one post every one to two weeks. And as I mentioned, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. So really at the end of the day, when you compile everything together, it's like one to two hours per week that we really pour into our social media efforts. Great. The next question is, I'm curious whether you think that the faculty engage with residents are those who are more comfortable with social media. And if so, um, how you feel those faculty not comfortable with social media can become engaged? That's a great question. Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead Julie. Go first. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say, I definitely feel like that's the case. Um, there are definitely a, a kind of a small crew of our um, attendings who are really involved in social media and already were prior to this project. Um, and it's been really fun to actually see the interaction and engagement between our residents and um, their attendings. I think, you know, in, in pediatrics and, and at Stanford, I think we do a good job of sort of breaking down the hierarchy and things like that. But I think in that realm, you can really see that because we're all learning together. Um, so that's been really fun to see. I think my, I guess my best advice would be just to sort of dive in. It's not hard to make a Twitter account. I know it can be a little bit daunting, but just to sort of, um, you can be a bystander for a while and watch and see what people are doing. Um, get into the world of med Twitter and follow a few key accounts and see how things are going. Um, and then I think it becomes relatively natural to, to get engaged in that way. Right. I think there's a spectrum of social media use. Um, like when we set out to start this, there were a bunch of people that we recommended uh, other residents follow. And, you know, our last week's Grand Round speaker, Dr. Kimberly Manning, was someone that we all followed on Twitter and we're very excited to have her uh, present. Uh, but not everyone has to be a Dr. Manning who's posting, you know, every day about um, their, their life uh, interacting with patients. Um, there are the people who use it just to read and sort of curate their own feed. Um, doesn't necessarily require participation, but sometimes it happens naturally, and I think that's great. Excellent. The next question is, did residents express a need for training related to online conversations with vaccine-hesitant individuals as a result of promoting the COVID-19 vaccines? You know, I don't think we, we did not formally organize any sort of uh, training around those conversations. But I do recall um, several of our morning reports led by our teaching seniors who have uh, talked about, you know, vaccine promotion and how we as physicians have a duty and responsibility to promote those vaccines. Um, I think a lot of people also encouraged one another to post their vaccine selfies for exactly that, to encourage other people to say, hey, it's safe, let's do this let's do this together, but um, I, we did not have any specific formal training on that. Excellent, uh, two more questions uh, from Dr. Blankenberg. What do you see as the next frontier in social media and education, both for our program and nationally? TikTok, Dr. Blankenberg, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, but honestly, I do think that a lot of people are flocking over to um, things like TikTok to even teach. Um, and I think more than ever, I think we're still dragging our feet in terms of even getting our Twitter accounts or getting onto Instagram. So I think those are the first few steps that we really have to get everybody on board with. Um, and then uh, together we can tackle the next, next frontier. Yeah, and I think there are tons of new opportunities and like we mentioned I think it's it's involving the different areas of the hospital and our um, educational leadership um, and finding ways to make education more accessible. One of the things that we saw this last year was medical students really jumping on the um, 
jumping on the social media train and uh, for pediatrics, uh, there is the uh, Stanford, not Stanford, sorry, the Future Peds Res um, sort of uh, coalition or group of people who led this social media effort to help other applicants navigate the application process in a really weird virtual season that was unprecedented. And that was really cool to see, you know, medical students sort of engaging and connecting with one another in that way. And I think there's so much opportunity for, um, uh, you know, linking across different organizations. And I think that's, that's our next step is finding ways to get, you know, pediatric residents, not just at our institution together, but all over the country. Great. The next question is about work hours and whether residents' time on social media should be counted as part of their work hours and how you get them to separate uh, and not necessarily engage over the weekend. That's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, well, for us personally, I, I think it really is up to us, um, this fluidity of how we want to use our work hours. So, like, would we rather have this from 4 to 5 p.m. to just have a time to, like, take a break and then use that on Saturday, use that hour on Saturday to like post. Like we've certainly done that. Like we certainly posted on the weekends in lieu of using our Friday time specifically, but um, I, I wasn't sure if this question was directed towards residents and if that counts towards their work hours. Um, we currently don't count them towards but work hours per se. They have to be doing clinical work at this time, but it's an interesting question that you post. Yeah, I, I think of social media sort of as like your own personal education, much in the same way like we, yes, we might count formal and required didactic teaching as work hours, but we don't necessarily uh, have like, you know, at home reading of journals as part of work hours. So I think in the same way, like this is essentially the new age equivalent of reading a journal article, just maybe more recently published in, in real time. Great. And the last, oh, we're getting a couple more questions coming in. Um, Another question is about looking at applicants' social media profiles as part of the recruitment process. Um, how do we, what, what role do we um, do in that? And is that appropriate? I, I think anybody who posts things on social media have to be aware that it's public um, and that they should be responsible adults as to what they decide to post on there. Um, and so, I, Maybe Kara, you can also even answer as to like how, how we go through our applicants and whatnot and what are our processes in terms of social media as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I have heard of uh, programs looking specifically at folks' um, social media profiles. We currently don't routinely do that. Um, so we, we take their file that is submitted to us um, but I, I guess if there was something that was brought to our attention that was a concern, I think it would be hard to, you know, ignore that. Um, but we don't routinely search through everyone's social media profiles. And there's so many different modes of social media that I'm not sure how we do that well. Um, I think this is the last question. Personal, family, friend, circles, hospital, lab, university, employee health, public news groups, um, send email, tweets. Snapchat, WhatsApp, Slack messages. How do you manage residents who wish to opt out of more obligatory message channels from work, residency, et cetera? Before and after work, I get screen toxic and pressure to keep up is harsh. I think the key term in that question was obligatory work. I, I think when we went about implementing this, our goal was not to make it obligatory. We you know, our initial goal was just to get everyone on it, to take a look around, to try to utilize it. Um, and like uh, I think Sam had mentioned earlier, you know, we tried to uh, we tried to make our messages and we think of them like what, what is required reading and that typically goes out in an email and then the more like gentle reminders or things that aren't necessarily like have to be seen um, uh, go through Slack. And I think the, the, the function on Slack of mute notifications, which I did before this even started for two hours, I think is totally appropriate. And I think people need to realize that, you know, off time is off time. And just like an email, if someone does not respond, that that is their, you know, personal time and they don't need to be doing that. Um, and I think we all need to take that time to ourselves where we shut off the computer and get away from our phones for a little bit. Um, but I think that takes a little bit of uh, personal pushing, but we 
very strongly in our positions did not want to force this on anyone. Great, and I know you have some data that not every resident has joined Twitter or Slack even for that matter, and that is a choice, which means we do have to use email for essential communication. So. Well, wonderful. Huge thank you again to our incredible chief residents and thank you to all of our participants who stayed on until the end. Hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.